welcome home to New City Church and happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Now, if you are new with us or if you have questions or if you have prayer requests, we have people ready to chat with you on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or by texting the number below. Uh, you can always go to newcity.life to connect with us, to give or to learn more about New City Church. Uh, you'll even find our New City Vault that has a lot of great worship and teaching content that you can check out. And so uh, we want to invite you to, to just uh, connect with us in whatever way that you'd like to. Now, if you haven't already liked this content, you're going to like it. And if you haven't already subscribed or followed, take a minute and do that now. That will help us all to stay connected. Now, our mission at New City Church is to love God and serve the city. Those two ideas of growing in relationship with God and serving our communities and our world, those are our passion. That's our passion together. Now, I want to invite you to be a part of that. And if you want to know how you can take next steps in your relationship with God or that you can join us in serving, text CONNECT to that same number and we will help you find a place to grow. We have a four-step journey that we invite everyone to join in on and it's like this, know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. If you can do that, no matter where you are in that journey, we would be so excited to walk with you. Now that mission that we talked about of loving God and serving the city, it is moving forward only because of the generosity of everybody who gives at New City Church. So what happens is your giving gets translated into changed lives. And we have so many stories of changed lives that it is it's exciting, it's awesome. Your right now resources can make a forever difference in somebody's life. We make it easy for you to connect with us as a giver. You can, you can give by text or you can go online. And so I just want you to know this. Thank you in advance for helping move that mission forward, especially now as we transition into these new phases of meeting and, uh, and reaching our community post-pandemic. Praise God. Now, it is Father's Day, and I've been trying to make a big deal about that ever since I became a father. In our home, I try and make a huge deal out of Mother's Day in the hopes that I can set the bar really high for the next month when it's Father's Day. Now, being a dad is awesome but it can be challenging too. And so you have to focus on the prize. Don't let the haters slow you down. You have to have a little bit of swagger as a dad that just tells people around you, I don't care what you people think. I make my own people now. That's why we can wear socks with our sandals. That's why having a dad bod is cool. That's why the jokes that we tell can be as corny as we want them to be. And as a matter of fact, on a day like today, telling a good dad joke is a badge of honor. So what we've done is this. We got together a few great dads to see who has the best dad jokes. It's gonna be a two v two challenge. Tommy and Richie versus Jason and Doug, who, by the way, Doug is incidentally the newest dad of the bunch since May 27th. Congrats to Doug and Caitlin. And so here it is, dad jokes. All right, I'm Jason, this is Tommy, this is Richie, this is Doug. And this is dad jokes. They're the worst. Are you ready? Let's do it. <laughs> ah, shoot! Okay. What do you call a snowman with a six pack? Ooh. I don't know. An, abom <laughs> An abominable snowman. An abdominable. <laughs> An abdominal. An abdominal. An abdominal snowman. I should have. Yeah, we're we're ready, Jack. <laughs> That's, uh, I uh, I recently got a job as a waiter. Puts food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I really try not to laugh there. What's the best cereal to eat late in the fourth quarter? Nothing. Cinnamon toast crunch time. Mm. Okay, we'll get there. Why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Butters. Because they lack toes. Lack toes. Lack toes. 
Got it. Not funny. Michael! What's the leading cause of dry skin? Towels. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Point. In the, in the video, you gotta, this thing should be bing! <laughs> Do you know why nurses carry red crayons? To read the... To draw blood. <laughs> Don't laugh. Oh, yeah. Do you find it hard to work from home? Yeah. Because all I want to do is a zoom, zoom, and a zoom, zoom. All I want to do is zoom, zoom, and a zoom, zoom. All right. Uh, what do you call a girl that breaks up with you via Instagram? You're familiar with that. <laughs> Happened to me all the time. All the time. <laughs> a girl that breaks up with you via Instagram. Just a person that doesn't have very good social skills. Yeah. Or you just call them a DMX. Oh. Stop. X going. Stop. X going. Stop. That's a laugh. I wasn't laughing, I was laughing at myself. Knock, knock. Who's there? Oh, I'm gonna get you. Britney Spears. Britney Spears who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Bang. Bang. <laughs> Why don't you see elephants hiding in trees? They're too big. Because they're so good at it. How do you find uh, Will Smith in the snow? You look for the Fresh Prince. Oh, I was gonna say look for the year. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playgrounds where I spend most of my days. Those jokes are whack, dude, I don't like them. All right. Uh, this is a true story. Um, what do you call a dinosaur that knows a lot of words? A thesaurus. <laughs> Saw it coming. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk. Why can't a nose be 12 inches long? N nobody knows. Because then it would be a foot. Got it. <clears throat> what do you call someone with no body and no nose? I think I, nobody knows. Yeah, you just said it, yeah. nobody okay. knows. Okay. <laughs> this one, this one, I need you to do my, the answer. Cause, yeah, because we'll get a bang if you do, ready? All right, here we go. Bing, here we go, bing. What is Whitney Houston's favorite kind of coordination? And I will always hit that high note. <laughs> no. Nothing. Wow. And I. Oh, hand. See, I heard of the and I, not the not the hand eye. That's why you had it on a silver platter. I mean, that's definitely. Yeah. What uh, what did the skeleton say before dinner? I'm hungry. I'm skin and bones. Bone appetite. <laughs> His whole family thought it was humorous. <laughs> that was good. What kind of shoes do ninjas wear? Nin ninja shoes, Nike. Oh, I got it. Do you know? Yeah. Sneakers. Uh, they wear sneakers. You didn't know that. <laughs> they wear sneakers, Tommy. When does a joke become a dad joke? when it's the funniest joke you've ever heard. When the punchline becomes apparent. Did you guys keep score? Us either, we won. We won. We won. We won. Happy Father's Day, New City Church, to all the dads out there. You're doing a great job. Just keep doing better and better and better. Just remember, your jokes really are the worst. We love you, New City. Happy Sunday. For real, dads, keep up the great work. Bye! <laughs> I want to offer a formal apology for that. Um, just kidding, some of those jokes were actually pretty good. Uh, so stay tuned, they might make their way into a sermon soon. Um, but we want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, spiritual fathers, and more. No dad is perfect, but by God's grace, we are gonna continue to get better. That's our commitment. Think today, on this Father's Day, what an amazing gift it was when Jesus taught his disciples to pray by starting out and saying, Our Father. This idea that the God who fashioned universes invites us to relate to him as his beloved sons and daughters, that is amazing. 
And no matter how beautiful or how painful our experience with fathering has been, we have a perfect Heavenly Father who loves us and who is committed to us. So here's what we're going to do today. Let's bring our whole hearts to Him in thanksgiving and praise today as we worship Him together. Let's worship Him, New City Church. Good morning, New City Church. Welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. We're just celebrating the matchless love and sacrifice of our Savior. Will you join us? Will you worship with us? The passion of our Savior The mercy of our God The cross that leaves no question Will you sing the next part with us? Our chains are gone. Our debt is paid. The cross has overthrown the grave. For Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death. praise you today that in our place of need, you are always there with us. You say in your word that when we pass through the fire, you'll be with us. 
And so, God, we believe that in the midst of those difficulties, God, that's when our praise is the purest. Thank you, Lord. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes and fights for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. God 
we're so grateful that you cause all things to work together for our good and for your glory. Even if we can't see it now, we trust you. This heavy load was never mine to bear, so I cast my cares upon you, Lord. This weary road I've traveled for so long, won't you take my hand and lead me on? You are working all things for my good. You are working all things for my good. And when I cannot see it, God, I still believe it. You are working all things for my good. Romans 8:28 says, "We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose." What does it mean when we say God can cause all things to work for our good? Well, you can read the commentaries, you can study the original Greek text, and you will find that all things means 
all things. In our nation today, we are reckoning with a great deal of past and present pain from racism and injustice in our country and in our communities. Now, as a church community, we have spent hours and hours praying, listening, learning together. And as difficult as this has been, I believe that God is in it and he is able to cause all things to work together for good for them who love him and who are called according to his purpose. When COVID-19 hit, we began to pray daily through 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It was this verse in the Old Testament that said that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from wickedness, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. We had no idea really what we were praying for. But let me say this, as a student of history and as a student of the scriptures, I think that what we are going through now in our nation has been an answer to that prayer. It is part of the healing process that we have had to re-examine this wound, that we have had to talk about it, that we have had to process through it together. And I thank God that I believe he's bringing healing to our nation. Now what's happening now is our conversations are beginning to turn from that initial shock, anger, and sadness to the question of, well, can we talk about what we do now? How do we bring healing? And as the church, as a church for New City Church, the way we have committed to serve our city is through a framework called the Peace Plan. Planting and partnerships, education, arts, compassion and enterprise. That acronym PEACE, it, it is, it's the framework that we're saying, this is how we're going to serve our community. Now next month, we're gonna actually start working on some of those initiatives for neighborhoods in our area. We're partnering with Convoy of Hope and you'll hear more about that as time goes on here. But I wanna tell you about this because I, I, wanna, I wanna introduce our speaker for today to you. At the beginning of this year, Jesse and I were invited along with two other couples to spend a few days together uh, with Mark and Laura Batterson, praying, talking, learning. Now, one of those couples uh, was Joshua and Erica Simonette. And during those few days together, um, th that was my first real introduction to Josh. I'd, known, I'd, I'd actually met him before. I, I'd known him just a little bit, but we spent that time together and I felt like God just knit our hearts together. Now, Josh played as a defensive back in the NFL for a few years, and then he went on to in, into ministry as a youth pastor and teaching at our sister church. He's the teaching pastor at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. During those days together, sharing our hearts and praying, that was when, when it was Josh's turn to share, he began to talk about how God was moving him and his wife, Erica, and their four children out of Washington, D.C., how he felt like they were, he was leading them to plant a church in Baltimore, Maryland. And let me just tell you, as we sat around the kitchen table, there were tears that were coming down his face as he, ta as he talked about his experience as a young black man and how deeply he felt called to be in a mentoring role in public schools and, and actually to disrupt the school to prison pipeline that is at work in so many cities in America. Now, I really think that for change to come to our youth in the United States, we're gonna need great fathers like Josh to step up and to be present. And so I am, I am really excited about what God is leading him and his family to do in Baltimore. And as we have grown closer now over the past few months, I've been looking for the opportunity to bring Josh's voice into the mix at New City Church. And I think today is a great day to do it. I am so honored and pleased to introduce you to Pastor Josh Simonette and to have him bring God's word to us today. New City, so good to be with you this weekend. Grateful for my friend, Pastor Steve, who is allowing me this opportunity to share with you all uh, this weekend. I bring you greetings from the East Coast. Uh, I'm one of the teaching pastors at National Community Church in Washington, D.C., but I live in Baltimore, Maryland, where I recently moved with my family to launch a church there. And we've also launched a nonprofit called Blueprint aimed at disrupting, disrupting the school to prison pipeline. If you have a Bible, will you meet me in Acts uh, chapter number 15? We'll get there in just a second. But before we do, I got to shout out all the dads. Hey, big shout out and happy Father's Day to all of our dads who are present and investing in the lives of their kids. And hey, you know what? I also recognize that during this time, uh, there are some of us who may not have our dads in our lives for a, a variety of different reasons. Or maybe you have a strained relationship with your dad. And 
If that's the case, I just want to pray God's blessings uh, upon you and uh, peace in your heart from my Heavenly Father. And I hope you feel that this weekend. No doubt this has been a challenging few months for um, many of us. Uh, specifically and personally for me as a black man in this country, uh, the last several weeks have been uh, extremely exhausting for me. I'm reminded of a story that I read this week of a man named Calvin. Calvin is a health inspector for the state of Minnesota and he happens to be a black man. Two days after the death of George Floyd that many of us uh, witnessed on video, uh, Calvin decided that he needed to call the police. And he called the police not because there was anything wrong with him or there was anything going on at the time, but he didn't want anything to happen. So he called the police uh, to let them know that he was about to do his job. Uh, let me quote you on what Calvin said directly to the police when he called. He said, I wanted to inform or, or let you know that I'm an inspector just in case a citizen calls and says some strange man is walking around. Now I want you to just let that just sink in for just a second. Because that's the picture of our world currently right now. A black man feels the need to call the police on himself because he's seen in recent events what can happen if people uh, call the police and he's seen as a threat. Now before you think that that's an anomaly or it's a one-off or it's an, it's an extreme example, it's actually very a personal example. Because my neighbor and I, who happens to also be a black guy, we were sitting in my backyard a couple of days ago, literally talking about how we intentionally engage uh, neighbors and dog walkers uh, as they walk by. We smile, we say, say hello. We intentionally wave at the security that circles the area because we want them to know that a black man lives in the neighborhood. A black man lives in that house, in this affluent, predominantly white, neighborhood because we know that our skin uh, can sometimes be seen as a threat. W.E.D. Du Bois writes about this in his book called The Souls of Black Folks. He calls it this double consciousness. And literally what he's talking about, he's just talking about this consciousness that we have to have in order to survive. Now, fortunately for Calvin, this event with him calling the police, it ended up well for him. As a matter of fact, the policeman that he talked to on the phone happened to be a white man and he apologized to him for even having to make this call. But then he took it a step further. He actually came to meet Calvin and walk with him as he did his inspection. And as those two men walked together and they began to talk, they found a personal connection that they had, which led to many similarities that they had in their lives. You know, I just wonder how many dividing walls around us would dissipate if we empathetically responded to the distress of people around us. Not just black people or white people or Asian people or Hispanic, but just people. I wonder what would happen if we decided uh, not to prioritize political correctness or personal comfort when it came to just responding. I wonder what would happen if we listen as opposed to label. And I also wonder as a Jesus follower myself, if the, the, what would happen if the church stopped dividing the gospel into liberal and conservative issues? And we actually took our place as representatives of the way. You see, the way is the name given to the early followers of Jesus. Yet from its inception, the, the beginning of, of this movement, even the church has struggled with supremacy, racism, and division. And it's still an issue that we grapple with today. So this weekend, I thought I would zoom in on a pivotal uh, situation that happened uh, in early church history. It, it happened in Acts chapter 15, over 2,000 years ago and I think it's something that we need to be reminded of if we've read before or something that we can learn from. At this particular time Jesus' death, burial and resurrection had literally turned the world uh, upside 
down and his disciples had begun organizing uh, the people of the way or Jesus followers. But as they got going and as as momentum uh, uh, picked up, they, they had this one thing that they needed to resolve. There's this one big issue and, and it was an us versus them problem. And it was this, could non-Jews, them, known as Gentiles, be down with Jews, us, the people who follow Jesus? And you have to understand that this, this, was, this was bigger than, you know, all of the things that you had to do as a Jew, the ceremonial laws, the rituals, the circumcision, the diet, all of those sorts of things. This was really a, a people issue. Gentiles, can they, can they be down? Do we want to be down with those people? Do we want them with us? Can they follow Jesus? Many of these leaders disagreed on, on how to move forward. And it's no different than it is today, as many of us within the church disagree on issues of justice and, and how that is executed. For some reason, the Jesus followers have adopted this, these political philosophies and inaccurate narratives that are incongruent at best with the gospel and a threat to the furtherance of the gospel at worst. And I say a threat to the furtherance of the gospel because how are we as Jesus followers going to represent a God of love, a God who loves all, yet you won't speak on behalf of issues that are impacting my community? So in Acts 15, the apostles, the elders, all of the big wigs got together and they had what was called the Jerusalem Council. And Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, he, he shares some critical testimony that I want us to zoom in on today. We'll pick this up in verse number seven in Acts 15. And here is what it reads. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. And this is the key verse right here. He says, he did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Listen, this was huge testimony right here. This, this was a major shift. I mean, this, this was a shift like uh, LeBron James's decision to take his talents to South Beach. I mean, th this was a shift like, I don't know if you watch uh, Beverly Hills 90210 back in the day like I did. This, this, was, this was a seismic shift like Dylan and Brenda breaking up. Or more uh, recently, this would have been huge like Meghan Markle and uh, Prince Harry giving of uh, the queen the deuces and saying, we're out of here. Peter steps up after all of this back and forth. And he says, yo, check this out. Th this is this is the deal. God, through Jesus, saved all of us and he did not discriminate. There's some who thought that. In order to follow Jesus, you needed to be culturally Jewish. So that meant that you need to do all of the things that the Jews did. But basically what they were summarizing is you needed to do what was comfortable to us. You needed to do what was familiar to us. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I say we elevate our personal comfort. We, we're, we're only willing to go as far as what makes us comfortable. And this is what... They were saying, but, but Peter interjected and he said, why are we burdening them? And as a matter of fact, all of these ceremonial things, we and our ancestors have had so much trouble trying to manage those things. Why would we put this on them? But here's the, the thing that I wanted to really highlight. Peter is a Jew. And the last time I checked, as I studied what was happening at the Jerusalem Council, I don't think any Gentiles were invited to this meeting. 
And so how is it that Peter, who is a Jew, is advocating on behalf of the Gentiles? That's, that's such a great question. I'm so glad that you asked. In order to really get context for that, I think we need to back up just a few chapters to Acts chapter 10. Because Peter would have been on the other side of this argument. But, but, but something happens in chapter 10 uh, of Acts, and, and he has a revelation through his experience with a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion. He's a, he's a Gentile believer in Jesus, and he has a vision in prayer. And God tells him, send men to Joppa to go get this man, Peter. But then at the same time, Peter is praying uh, as well. And Peter is having a vision of animals um, that, that Jews would have been forbidden to eat. And he hears a voice that says, kill and eat. And Peter responds, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. And the voice responds to him, which is the Holy Spirit, that says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three different times. And Peter is trying to figure out what's happening here. Cornelius says, men show up. They knock on the door. The Holy Spirit says, don't be afraid to go with these men. Uh, the, the men uh, take Peter and Peter arrives at Cornelius' house. And I love what Peter uh, says when he engages with Cornelius for, for the first time. He says, it is against the law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. He is, is highlighting the, the, the separatist nature of this relationship. But then he goes on to say, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. This whole vision that he was having was not about food. It was not about uh, diet. It was about a discrimination against people. That's what this was about. So then Cornelius tells Peter all the things that was happening and how he was praying and he had these visions um, and everything that led up to their meeting and how God told him to, to send for Peter. And then Peter realizing that he was praying at the same time. He's putting all of these things together. This is what he says in verses 34 and 35 of Acts 10. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. As Peter continued to speak, there was a move of the Holy Spirit in the room. Stuff was happening and it was clear that God had given the gift of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles as well. And Peter and the people with him were astonished, but it was a confirmation for him. As we jump back to Acts 15, when Peter is sharing his experience in Acts 10 with the Jerusalem council, he's not talking about a diversity movement. He, he's not talking about some initiative uh, that, that would bring people together on the surface. He, he's not talking about some theoretical idea. He's sharing from his personal experience. And this is key for us to understand because what we are experiencing in our culture today, what we are seeing as we turn on the news and, and we look at social media, what we are seeing is a lack of communal experience. We're seeing communities clashing because they don't have relationship. They've only been in proximity. And I know Pastor Steve was preaching about this uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but, but, but there's a lack of communal experience happening. So I just want to offer you two brief points this weekend. Number one, seismic shifts happen in us and in our culture around us when we experience one another in an authentic way. Acts 15 shifts, or the Acts 15 Peter, I should say, shifts drastically because of what happened to the Acts 10 Peter. It would have been very difficult and unlikely at best for Peter to advocate for the Gentiles without a personal experience in the house of a Gentile. 
Cornelius. And if he's unwilling to go to his house, his perspective probably doesn't change. And I think the same is true for us. It's, it's hard for my white brothers and sisters to become the allies that the African-American community would, would like and would hope for if you don't have these authentic experiences with us, if you don't share in the pain with us, if you don't hear our story and carry uh, the, the bur- help us carry the burdens of our experience, if you don't understand what is going on with us without personal experience, and I would also add to that education and understanding of how we got here, we can't close the ignorance gap. And I love what Brene Brown says in terms of how we do that. She says we just need to move in. And that that brings me to my second point as Brene Brown is talking about moving in because no one should be better at this than the church. And the reason for this is because as Christ followers, Jesus literally showed us the blueprint. He literally showed us the way. Did did he not intentionally go after the us versus them divide? We see it several times in scripture. Uh, Matter of fact, Mark chapter three, when he healed the man on the Sabbath, that is that is and that that is him going against a traditional uh, divide, uh, a divide within the law that. He had compassion on this man who needed to be healed and he healed him on on in a day or or on a day when he was not supposed to do so intentionally. When Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, which again, Pastor Steve mentioned uh, recently, that was a cultural divide that Jesus intersected or, or put himself in the middle of. Because here's the thing, the Jews would go around Samaria let alone go through them or interact with people in Samaria. And it was also improper for Jesus to even be having a conversation with this woman. Shall I continue? (laughs) What about when Jesus says to the Roman centurion that his faith was greater than anything observed in Israel? What a slap in the face to the Jews. He's saying this to a Roman centurion who would have been a Gentile and he's a centurion, which represented Roman occupation. The Jews did not like those people. Another huge cultural divide that Jesus intersects in. What what about even amongst his own disciples? Jesus picks Matthew, a tax collector, and Peter, a zealot. Those would have been two groups who didn't hang out with each other. Matter of fact, they hated each other. But Jesus picked them and put them on his team. The two groups were enemies. But here's the sum of what I'm saying. Being a Christ follower is not about being on the sideline or creating a separatist movement. You can't be following the example of Jesus Christ and and, and, and live that way. Loving our neighbor is not an if-then statement. If my neighbor falls into this category or if my neighbor expresses things in this way, if my neighbor protests this way, then I will. No, that's that's not the way that it works. So what Jesus did when he ate with tax collectors and prostitutes and healed people on the Sabbath and made uh, two enemies, his, his disciples, is show us that we are to go to great lengths, not to just get in the mix of stuff, but to show love and compassion. Why? Because the whole point is to reconcile us back to God and one another. And that often means us walking into the middle of the us and them divide. Jesus didn't say in John 13, 35, he didn't say, they will know you are my disciples by your church denomination. (laughs) He didn't say that. He didn't say, They will know you are my disciples if you are conservative or a liberal or if you can trace your Jewish roots or if you're defending the faith on social media, which some of us need to really stay off of social media, but that's another conversation. No, he said, they will know by your love. When we intentionally walk into the divide, which is an act of justice in order to make peace, We are showing how Jesus transcends any barrier, cultural, economical, sociological, any barrier you can name. 
So the conclusion of the Jerusalem Council, which I won't get into, read Acts 10 and Acts 15 at your leisure so that you can get more of the details of the story. But basically what they concluded was, hey, we're prioritizing the wrong things here. And let's prioritize being a committed community of Jesus followers over being culturally Jewish Jesus followers. What are we prioritizing here? And I'll leave you with these concluding thoughts this weekend. I'm not going to romanticize this whole coming together thing. I think we, as Pastor Steve talked about, have just been okay with proximity. But you know what I call that? I think we've been okay with uh, separate but equal. A continuation of what we have seen in years past, where we're okay with crossing paths in the grocery store. Hey, we're okay with maybe even uh, sitting next to each other at, at, at work or maybe even singing a few worship songs uh, on Sunday. But our lives do not truly intersect with one another. We're not in community with one another. And to do that will, will be uncomfortable sometimes. It will be a, a difficult commitment to make. As a matter of fact, let me just tell you that this same guy, Peter, who stood up in front of the Jerusalem council and made this, this, this great statement to advocate on behalf of Gentiles. Do you know that Paul later in Galatians calls him out because Paul was at the same council? He calls out Peter, who is eating with Gentiles, but then when a representation of, of, of Jews are coming, he then switches things up because he's afraid of what they will say. So again, it's not enough for us to just agree to do this and that we should do this. But when the rubber meets the road and it gets hard or there's criticism or, or we have to push our chips to the middle of the table and it costs us something, will we continue? This is, this is a difficult commitment. And hey, sometimes there's going to be hurt. There's going to be misunderstanding. There's even going to be situations where people you're trying to reach out to and engage with, they don't want to engage. That's okay. That's a part of the process. We continue to love our neighbor because as I said, it's, it's not a conditional thing. The, another thing that I want to highlight is when we choose to do this, we begin to develop an awareness and an appreciation even if we don't fully agree or understand. It's about broadening our perspective. And one of the ways we do that is by reading books. And let me just say, hey, when you read books and you try to get educated to, to close the ignorance gap, it's not about agreeing with everything that you read, but it's about understanding the perspectives from different angles. Understanding uh, how people are co have come to certain conclusions and being able to engage with them. And I believe that's one of the reasons why Paul was so effective in his ministry because he was educated and he understood the perspectives of the people that he was engaging with. And finally, I would just say, hey, be open to listen, listening and learning and explore, exploring and engaging without judgment. You just might learn something. As Christ followers, we're not called to take the easy route. And in the name of peace, we're often trying to erect dividing walls so we don't have to engage. That's called peacekeeping. But the last time I checked when I read the Beatitudes, Jesus called us to be peacemakers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. That means that we're called to the middle of the action. So my challenge to you this weekend is where are you? And will you get in the middle of the action? And will you be who Jesus has called us to be? Will you be a peacemaker? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity. There's so much that I wanted to say that I couldn't say that I wanted to get into. My heart is just so full and overwhelmed. But God, I pray that we would have the boldness of Peter to understand that we need to be willing to get in the middle of the divide. And we need to be able to advocate on behalf of those in our community who are 
suffering or looked down upon or who are not included. But then also, God, protect us from ourselves. Protect us from the other version of Peter that we saw who, uh, when he ate with Gentiles, he was cool. But when he heard that the Jews were coming, he, he switched it up. God, help us to not be concerned about what's going to happen to us. Help us be to be so focused on being obedient to what you called us to. We need more of your spirit. That's the answer to all of the things that we're trying to figure out. Just give us more of your spirit. Lead us in the way that you have us to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to Pastor Josh for sharing today and for bringing God's word to us. I want to remind you today that the Bible says that at one time we were all outsiders to God's plan. But miraculously, we got invited in. How? Then you got to ask, how did we get invited in when we were complete and total outsiders, strangers to God's plan? And the Bible gives us the insight. That moment when Jesus took upon himself our sin and our punishment, the Bible says that they forced Jesus to carry his cross outside of the city where he would die a common criminal's death. And that was part of the plan there. That was part of the, the, uh, the actual punishment was that when those who were crucified died, that they were supposed to die outside the city walls to be sure that everyone knew they had been cast out. But let me give you the great news today. Because Jesus was cast out, you and I have been brought in. So how can we respond to that? I think it's as simple as ABC. When we talk about the love of God for sinners like you and me, that he would allow himself to be cast out so that we could be brought in, it starts with just admitting that we need to receive the mercy of God, that you and I were sinners, that were strangers, outsiders to God's plan, but to believe, that's a, the A part is to admit, the B part is to believe that Jesus paid the price for your and my sin. And that C part is to simply confess it with our mouths. So if you have not done so today, I wanna invite you to respond to, to receive that love of God, that gift of God of salvation from sin, and just to simply admit, believe, and confess it with your mouth. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And praying this prayer from your heart is just that way of acknowledging today that you know what God has done for you and that you are accepting and receiving that gift. So pray with me together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my guilt, and my shame, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with the Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, we wanna celebrate with you. We wanna be able to rejoice with you today and we wanna help you take next steps to be able to continue to follow after Jesus. So just put it in the chat. Just say, I prayed that prayer or put it in the comments on Facebook. I prayed that prayer. Or you can even text new life to this number, that same number we've been using below. Just text us and let us know you prayed that prayer. We wanna rejoice. We'll follow up with you just to help you know how you can continue to grow in your relationship with God and to deepen that walk with God. It is amazing. The Bible says that to everybody who is in Christ, they are new. And so I am rejoicing with you today. Those of you, all those of you who prayed that prayer today, you are now made new by the grace of God. Ephesians 4.3 says this, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit binding yourselves together with peace. Now, to our fathers today, we love you and we celebrate you. And as a body today, we're gonna to commit ourselves to that unity that we talked about, and we're gonna lift our voices and celebrate our Heavenly Father who is faithful through every storm. Sing it with me now. And I'm gonna sing 
In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises burn Up from the ashes Hope will arise Cause death is defeated The King is alive I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise Father's Day. Thank you for being with us at New City Church.